Uh, as many of you may suspect, uh, I actually do not worship Satan, but I really enjoy reading about him. And uh, my first introduction to uh, Oklahoma's Satan, the Prince of Darkness, Gene Stipe, uh, <laughs> was through uh, our next uh, presenter, uh, Mark Singer, staff writer of The New Yorker. Uh, Mark's uh, book, Funny Money, uh, was uh, written in the late 70s, is that correct? Yeah, 80s. And uh, it, it still, to this day, continues to uh, rattle the, uh, the sensibilities of bankers and oilmen uh, in the States. So, uh, Mark, thank you so much. going to have to depend on notes a little bit. Um, sort of what I'm hearing all these uh, other speakers say tonight is what I've always felt, which is that Oklahoma is kind of a gift that keeps on giving um, in its own uh, fashion. Uh, once I got past the self-doubt that uh, defines adolescence, um, it left me with the imperative to ask impertinent questions that have really defined my life as a reporter. And with Oklahoma, always for me, the uh, endless overarching question has been, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, um, it doesn't ever go away. Uh, I'm going to have a few echoes of what Rilla was just talking about. When I uh, the Oklahoma I knew growing up in Tulsa, uh, it was in the middle of a century, I think it was the last one, uh, was a place where uh, it was possible to spend 12 years in a public high school as I did uh, and never encounter a person of color. Uh, at my high school, the best we could do was a pair of sisters who, uh, the Lee sisters, whose father was Chinese American and an ophthalmologist in town. Um, but uh, when I took U.S. history in high school, there was one, there were two books that were assigned. One was a survey book, a U.S. history survey book, and the other was uh, J. Edgar Hoover's Masters of Deceit, um, the story of communism in America and how to fight it, um, which eventually gave rise 50 years later to a young adult biography titled Master of Deceit, J. Edgar Hoover, and America in the Age of Lies. Um, and for my generation, uh, the most obvious missing chapter uh, from those books in retrospect was, of course, what Rilla was just referring to, the race riot, the deadliest race riot in American history. Um, it happened just a few miles away from where I grew up, went to high school, went to, and um, in a part of town that no one I knew ever would have ventured into. And of course, we couldn't read about it anywhere. Um, but I did know by absorbing all kinds of subliminal evidence that um, something was profoundly wrong with this place. And I didn't exactly know what that something was. So at 18, I left um, knowing that I'd be back often, but. Uh, it was unlikely that I'd be back permanently. Um, but I had friends there and I stayed in touch and uh, I uh, got a call in the spring of 1977 from a friend of mine from a, a place called Altus, Oklahoma, which is in southwest Oklahoma, but he, he lived in Oklahoma City and um, he said, I'm gonna send you something in the mail. And, and what he sent me was a, a newspaper clipping and it was about uh, how in Latimer County, Oklahoma, which is southeast Oklahoma and Little Dixie, part of what was the Choctaw Nation, in, in Latimer County, they had just had that year their first felony conviction by a jury in 25 years. Um, you could not get people to testify against their neighbors. They would shoot their dogs or burn down their barns or whatever. So. I decided um, that I would go there. 
and uh, write a story about frontier justice. And uh, uh, I just assumed that if I stuck around long enough, there would be a murder uh, in Main Street and, and no witnesses. So um, I spoke to the editor of The New Yorker, and I said, I want to go down there. And he said, OK. So I spent uh, that summer uh, living in, in most of the time in a cabin in Robbers Cave State Park. Um, and just hanging around, I was in Latimer County in Wilburton, the county seat, and I'm a really slow learner, um, and it just took me uh, all summer and then several months to figure out that I did not have a story because nothing had happened, but there had been a lot of what I thought were colorful, exotic things along the way. I was, um, I was hanging out with, I was riding around with sheriff deputies a lot. I was One day I was in the... Uh, Sheriff's Department there. They used to have a, the Bell Star Western Festival happened every June there, and that meant that the, the JCs, the Junior Chamber of Commerce, had a posse that would ride into the middle of town, and they would have a shoot 'em up, and guys would fall off the building and land on a mattress, and uh, it was just it was a cowboy playing playing at being cowboys. But I was in the uh, sheriff's office one day, and I was talking to this a sort of civilian employee, and I was asking him questions, and he said, well, you know, who you really need to talk to is Benny. And I said, well, uh, it's Benny. He said, well, Benny, Benny's our prisoner. And I said, well, okay, I'll talk to him just as soon as I'm finished talking to you. And he said, I don't think he's in right now. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, uh, all right, well, what's he doing? Where is he? And he said, oh, I think he's out towing the undersheriff's car. And I said, well, why, why is he towing the undersheriff's car? And he says, because it broke down. And um, so he said, oh, I will, I'll wait here until he comes back. He said, no, nah, nah, I'm not sure. He's working the rodeo tonight, but you, you want to try to talk to him. So it kept up like this. I, met, I made friends while I was there. I, I met a couple of guys in the, the next county, Haskell County, the county seat is Stigler. These are counties that have about 10,000 people, and, and they're big, but not, not densely populated. And so I, I met these two guys. Um, in Stigler, one of them family had the insurance agency there. One of them owned the dollar store. They were fresh out of Oklahoma State University. They were my age or year younger, and they'd uh, been out for, you know, they were fresh out. They'd been out for three or four years, and they were young businessmen in town. So I used to hang out with them. They would have uh, uh, parties on the weekend that I enjoyed going to with all kinds of different kinds of refreshments. and. Um, I was, uh, I was, I, I, they ended up, we ended up becoming friends and they, they eventually came to New York and, and I got to know them pretty well, but I, I decided it wasn't necessary to mention at any point, and this was the experience I had gathered growing up, that, that I was Jewish. It just didn't seem that this was important information, but they had a friend, a guy who'd actually worked in the White House, um, who had sort of, uh, decided to just drop out and he'd moved back to Stigler and he was uh, living in a trailer and he was making a living um, judging bird dog competitions but he would hang out with him and he was a very sophisticated guy but uh, you wouldn't know what to look at him so one day we were talking about this uh, something or other and he mentioned some family in Tulsa and he said you know who I think is a really good guy and he named the name of some Jewish guy in Tulsa. I said, okay, well, that's fine, you know. I, I was fine with that. So I, I let it go, and then uh, a couple months later, I was talking to one of these guys, Bobby Dale Spear, and I said um, something. He asked me a question. I said something, well, you know, like, that's because, you know, Jew, that's just something that Jews do. Or I don't remember what the question was. And he said, Singer, I'm glad you brought that up. It's kind of a sore subject. Said, What's that? And he said, well, what's the story on this Jewish deal? And I said, well, um, what's the story? I don't, I don't know. What, what's the question? He said, well, is a religion or what? <laughs> and uh, I, I think so, Bob. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, I, uh, I didn't get that story, but I then went back the following year because Gene Stipe decided to run for the uh, U.S. Senate. He was a um, state senator from uh, McAllister area, and he was this sort of Snopesian figure who appealed to me a lot because he was a rascal. 
and he, uh, he was running for the Senate against David Boren, who was then the governor. Um, and um, I, I, I liked Stipe a lot more than I, I liked Boren, who was just this sort of, it struck me as this just goody-goody opportunist. Of course, he turned out to be a senator, and he's now the president of the University of Oklahoma and very successful. And um, I really enjoyed campaigning with Stipe, following him around, because uh, he was shameless, and um, we were in Boyce, Boyce City, Oklahoma one day, and this was 1978, so the Equal Rights Amendment was an issue in this country, and, uh, and uh, he was talking to some woman at a public meeting there, and she said, I want to know where you stand on the Equal Rights Amendment. And um, he said, well, um, I haven't really given a lot of thought, but until my people tell me that they're for it, I guess I'm against it. And um, that seemed to satisfy her. And uh, as we were, we left, and I said, "You know, uh, uh, Gene, you you told that woman you were you were against the Equal Rights Amendment, but when it was in the legislature here, you voted for it." And he said, "She asked me, and I told her where I stood on it today." Um, and um, he would get asked questions. Another big issue then was liquor by the drink. Um, Oklahoma didn't repeal prohibition until 1959, and you still, in 1978, could not buy uh, a mixed drink in Oklahoma uh, in, a, in a public place. And um, so they would say, you know, Gene, what do you think about liquor by the drink? And he'd say, well, it's the only way I've ever seen it consumed is by the drink. Um, and the Panama Canal was another very important issue then. Um, it was sort of culture war issue, I guess. Um, it aroused all the sort of jingoistic fervor that is endemic to Oklahoma. And um, when Stipe would get asked about it, he'd just say, um, if it ran through my district, I'd have a strong position on it. So um, I had high hopes, but um, during the middle of the campaign, uh, a grand jury was, uh, they did, there was a leak from a grand jury that he was about to be indicted, which eventually he was, and that pretty much put a damper on his campaign. Um, he'd already beaten a tax evasion indictment years before, but um, that was the end of it. And, um, but it, it whetted my appetite for Oklahoma, so when, in 1982, the oil boom busted. And uh, uh, this was, if you looked at the broad scope of history in the state, from um, really the, the Trail of Tears, the Land Rush, Statehood, um, the Dust Bowl, and then uh, came the oil and gas boom and bust. Uh, of course, the bombing of the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City has subsequently become another landmark event in the state. So I just decided um, to move back to Oklahoma for a year and a half, which I did. Um, and um, again, the New Yorker was nice about it, and uh, I, I stayed there for a, a year and a half. And just I rented a house and, and moved down there with my family. And um, I eventually um, uh, wrote this book, Funny Money, um, which um, I have to confess, um, when I'm self-indulgent, I still r read occasionally. Um, uh, because it, it captured what I care about most, which is this place that um, just kind of won't ever go away for me. Um, and I think I have a couple more books left in me. Um, one of them I know is about that place because um, of all the things that I've been trying to do, I, I, all these years I still am trying to answer that that big question, which is, what the fuck? <laughs>